So this is exciting that we have a Sunday dedicated to what's going on in the rest of the world. And you all know we do a great job here on the Divide through the food ministry and things like the, the Harvest Festival. What are we calling it? Candy shoot drive through. When I said, when I heard the word shoot, I knew where I was. <laughs> and uh, so, oh no, uh, that's not the kind I was thinking of. Well, uh, oh, okay, all right. But uh, <laughs> it is it is great to be able to to take a look outside ourselves. You know, one of the things is we are all holed up uh, in these this time of isolation. Is it's so easy to get lost in our own little cubbies and think that uh, that's, there's nothing outside. And that's, that's one of the ways that so many people get depressed. So I'm grateful that we are able to look outside ourselves and see the needs of the world, the things that are happening in the world. And thank you, Matt and Chelsea, for what you have given of your lives for God's purposes and are gonna continue to give as well and for leading up our missions activities here at this church. So Elaine and Cindy, We've traveled together. We've gotten to know each other over the years. And uh, Calvary Relief International, which he's going to explain to you some. You've already heard, many of you have heard about Calvary Relief before. You're going to hear more today. But uh, uh, they headed up, and it is, uh, it's a great way for, for God's people to be used in reaching the lost throughout the world. The Bible tells us we're supposed to be doing that. We're supposed to reach people in. First in Jerusalem, that's right here, and we do that. Judea, which is the area around, and you can imagine where that might be. It probably includes the whole divide and maybe even into the neighboring cities. And then uh, eventually it mentions the uttermost parts of the world, where that's where these guys are. They are utterly out there. And it's a, it's a blessing to know both Lane and Cindy. I don't know if Cindy's going to get a chance to talk today, but I know you can greet her in the, in the lobby at the table a little later on. And um, they have served as missionaries for many, many years, uh, some of that time full-time, some of it as part of ministry here in the U.S. And uh, what more can I say about these guys? Lane is a graduate of um, Mike McIntosh's school down in San Diego. He survived, which is uh, pretty amazing, both for Mike and for Lane. <coughs> and uh, they've served in Mexico for 10 years, and they've been serving faithfully since then in a lot of other roles. And I hope he gets a chance to tell you a little bit about what they've been doing for the last several months since they pulled up anchor. So with all of that in mind, I want to introduce to you my brother in the Lord, Lane Weddingo. Well, thank you so much for um, inviting us, Pastor Jay and Britt. It's a pleasure to be here. And, and what a joy to be able to sit and listen to these young um, missionaries be able to share what God has done through their ministry, bringing it home, bringing it together, um, organizing, praying is something that is so lacking in so many churches right now. A lot of people will go out, but trying to bring people together to continue giving, continue being active, um, continue praying is, uh, is something that's really lacking right now. Let me pray for this church and for you guys event, um, as individuals. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your presence here in this place. You are a God who is all around the world in every nook and cranny, but more importantly, you're a God that's in our hearts, that cares about our individual needs, our individual um, hurts and desires. You love us so much that you gave your son for us. So I pray, Father, that you would continue blessing this church as they are a blessing to others around this world. I love you, Lord, and I pray that when I step down from this pulpit today, that we would know you better and know your calling upon our lives even greater. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to start off with just a little introduction so you know who's talking to you. And I got my little handy-dandy clicker to see if it works. These guys are shaking back there. They're not sure, huh? It worked. As you can see, I married up. Obviously, we did not, well, not obviously, we, we didn't know the Lord when we um, got together, and so the first four years were tremendously hard. Oh, well, we almost didn't make it through it, and mostly my fault. Most guys can go, mm -hmm, I know what you're talking about. 
Um, but God, in his mercy, took us out of Tuolumne County. She grew up in Sonora. I grew up in the mountains above Sonora, Twain Heart and above. And um, he took us out of the county to separate us from all of our friends, I guess you want to call them that, and took us into San Diego. Here's a couple of mountain people in San Diego, not comfortable really with the city or, or with anything that was going on. But we knew that something was happening in our lives. We needed a change. We needed to start over fresh without the influence of all of our friends. Uh, we were invited to church by my sister, who had gotten saved in a Calvary Chapel, um, Horizon Christian Fellowship, San Diego, with Mike McIntosh. And um, I just remember saying no so many times. You know, no, I'm not going. No, I don't want to go. No, I have nothing to do with that. No, 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 no. Finally, one morning and one Saturday afternoon, it came out of my mouth. I'll go with you one time just to shut you up. <laughs> I went, what? Who said that? <laughs> uh, you know what happened. And that was 35 years ago. I cannot tell you. I can't tell anybody about that without crying. Because in that day, in that moment, in that situation, God had perfect timing to where my wife and I walked into a room angry and with our backs turned towards each other almost in a point of divorce and watching hippies and people in suits and old ladies and young people all with their hands raised worshiping somebody I didn't know. Within a half an hour, my wife and I, within an hour, my wife and I were down in front on our faces. Except the Lord, he saved our marriage, he saved our lives, he planted into us something that I didn't know existed. A love for others. Um, I was such a crybaby. That was 35 years ago. Can you imagine if this happened yesterday? <laughs> All right. That's the impact that Jesus wants to have in our lives. He doesn't, I don't believe a lot of people who say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but there's no change in their lives. There's no drive. There's no, there's no, um, Braveness, maybe you want to sell that guy's shirt back there. Be brave. What? No, be bold, huh? No boldness for Christ. There's no, there's no passion to follow Him. No passion to share Him. Can you tell me that? You try to tell me that the Creator of the universe stepped out of heaven and He placed His Spirit inside of you, and there's no change. I, I really want to encourage you without condemnation. I'm not trying to con con condemn anybody, but. Really look at your relationship with God. If you're not vibrant for Jesus Christ, what are you vibrant for? The creator of the universe indwells you. Let him live through you. And that is something that I've learned over the years, not from Bible teachers so much in the United States, but through Mexicans and through Africans and through Grenadians where we lived for a couple of years as well. Christians who have absolutely nothing and their lives are vibrant for him. They're alive for him. They are active for him. And I would come home so many times and I would say, where is the passion in my own church, in my own country? Maybe we need to be shook up by a disease. Maybe we need to be shook up by some fires. Maybe we need to get shook up by some persecution. Oh, um, did I say that? That kind of stuff is happening now, isn't it? My wife and I were married in 1981. We got saved in 1985. We went on the mission field um, in 1986. And uh, we were married 17 years without being able to have children. And we just left it into the hands of the Lord. We did not know um, what he had planned. But we were always volunteering in, in orphanages in Mexico and in Grenada as well. Nothing happened in Grenada, so several years later, uh, we were able to adopt two beautiful young ladies. They weren't young ladies when we adopted them. They were the oldest one in the white here is now 34. She was 12 when she came to live with us. Um, Anita was, um, we were in the hospital when she was born. Her mother went to um, a Christian counseling center in Ensenada, California, and spoke with Juan Domingo's wife about money for an abortion. Can you imagine? Um, here at a pastor's wife, and she got on the phone immediately. Are you guys um, willing to adopt a baby? 
And so we, came, we went all the way from where we were living in southern Mexico and lived in Ensenada for several months while the baby was um, getting ready. <laughs> this is Rosita uh, when she was in her 20s, um, beautiful young lady who grew up on the streets of Mexico, uh, abandoned basically, grew up with a bunch of other children, begging for food, doing tricks in the street, uh, washing dishes, washing whatever they you know, kind of a little Indian slave, basically. I don't know if you know what Mexico's culture so much. The light-skinned Mexicans, many of them look down on the Indian-type Mexicans. Um, it still happens around the world. Uh, she stole our hearts at a very young age. Unfortunately, she stole his heart, too, and I was a little jealous about that. <laughs> But I'm over it now because look what they brought us. You know, we're happy campers. We're grandparents for the first time. I'm going to cry again. Can you believe it? <laughs> this is our youngest now. She's now 21 years old and just started working for Adventist Health in Sonora, California over there. Beautiful. And now we are six. So that's our life story in a nutshell. Would you turn with me, please, to, the, to Psalm 67? What I'm going to share with you today is by no means a this is what you should be doing. What I'm going to share with you today, some of these verses God has used to shape and form my Christian walk with him. To allow me to put aside some of the things that are not so important as I thought they were and to pick up things that are more important to God himself. In Psalm 67, we're going to read the whole chapter. Starting in verse 1. God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Selah. That your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth. Say la, or think about this. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. And God and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. We all want to be blessed, don't we? We all ask God frequently to bless us in one way or another. Um, here we have David, who is writing a prayer of his, which was turned into music at that time. What a beautiful way of, of repraying or re, um, just thinking over how you speak to God, put it into, a, into music. I, I, I just envy these people who are musicians and can do that, you know, turn their prayers or per turn their, their worship of God into music. And that's what um, Paul, uh, David is doing right here. He is turning his prayer towards God into worship of God, but not just for himself. He's actually talking and thinking about the nations at this time. But so many of us, we as Americans, we are so blessed. We have everything we need, even if we don't know it. And so many times we have everything that we need, and we even have the things that we want. And what happens? We spend everything we have to get more. I'm guilty of it. And God has corrected me over the years. I'm not completely cured. Please pray for me. I still like to be comfortable. I still like my nice clothes. And that's nothing wrong with that. It depends on what your whole attitude is towards God and towards his plan for your life, which really matters. Some of us, he blesses financially um, and other ways so that they will do something for the people around them. But here we have David, and David starts out in verse 1, and he says, be merciful. Or have mercy on us as a people. You know what mercy is, right? Is He's asking God, don't give me what I really deserve. Don't give me punishment. Don't give me separation. Don't, don't just look angrily at me. Have mercy on me. And then the next one is bless me. 
Bless me is asking God for something. Really, it's really grace in a nutshell. A blessing is grace. God is giving us something that we don't deserve. So we have mercy, not giving us something that we do deserve, and grace. And they, they're like the Siamese twins. Grace is something that I don't deserve, but he gives it to me anyway. A relationship with Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit to indwell within me salvation for eternity. And then the third thing that I see in verse 1 there is, is David is calling out to God and he says, please cause your face to shine upon us. What does that mean? Can you imagine God's face shining upon you? I can. Only through Jesus Christ. There's a thing that I learned years ago that, you know, you take a pair of sunglasses and you color, or a pair of glasses like this and you, and you tint them red. And that really is the only way that God can look at you personally. That's the only way that you won't fry. Is a better way, not a better way to say that probably. But that you won't just crumble before him in shame. And those lenses that he's looking through is the filter of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ. He can't look at us without that filter because he is so holy and we are so not. So here, David is asking for mercy and for grace, basically salvation, so that he could stand before a God without being shameful and without being separated from him, without being fearful of being zapped. So here, this is a heartfelt cry for the people that were lived around him and for his nation. Please, God, be merciful, bless us, and shine your face upon us in a way that we're not ashamed to be in your gaze, if you will. What is God's purpose for blessing us so much as Americans? We are blessed. We are a blessed people. I've been to a lot of different countries, probably about a quarter as many as, as Britt has been in. He has many more great stories, and he, he's willing to tell you all of them. <laughs> I love it. We are a blessed people. We don't have to go into the streets usually and look for food that somebody else has dropped. We don't have to fear that our children are going to start a, die of starvation. We don't have to drink water that we know is polluted with human pollution. We don't have to do these things because for some reason God has chosen for us to be Americans or Europeans. God, why did God decide to bless us so much? What is the purpose that God is pouring these blessings out upon us? Spiritual and physical blessings. We are a blessed people. John 3.16 is definitely part of that answer. Part of that answer. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever will believe in him will not perish but have everlasting love. Love, life, love is the key word there. He loves you so much. So don't ever think that it's only because he loved you so much and that you're the center of his universe. Have you ever heard that before? Probably you have a good pastor, you might have. And it's not to put anybody down, but so many times as a Christian we say, like, like in um, Highway 108 between Sonora and Twainhart at one time, there was a great big plywood sign that was painted in in 1970s, painted in with a spray can that says, I made it, now shut the gates. <laughs> they obviously they didn't shut the gates back in the 70s because it's a whole different community as it used to be. But the, we get the sentiment, right? We accept the Lord. We accept all the blessings that he has for us. We love being in his presence. We love hearing about him. We know that he's got promises for us. And so many times we stop there. And we don't realize that there's a reason behind all of this besides just the fact that he does love us. And he does love us. Is Christianity, is our Christianity really all about our salvation? Is it really all about our eternal, eternal destination? Or did Jesus really die so that we could be blessed and happy and comfortable and safe, live Christian lives here in America in a nice home with a great retirement package in heaven? Yes, that's part of it. 
But there's other reasons. David Gusick, in his, he's a Calvary Chapel pastor in Santa Barbara. Um, he also writes commentaries, and he mentions in his commentary on Psalm 67, he says this, If I am to be blessed by God, there must be a better reason for being blessed than simply a blessing for me. You know, I used to be a member of the Bless Me Club, crying out to God, bless me, bless me again, and bless me two more times, please as if I hadn't already been blessed enough. And that stabbed me in the heart one year when I read that because there's so many times when my whole prayer is all about me. It's all about what I can get from God. I want to be closer to God, but why? I want to see God working miracles through me, but why? I want God to speak through me, but why? Why is it? So I can be closer and enjoy him more? Yes. But there's got to be more to it than that. In verse 2 of our, our text here in Psalm 67, David knew that there was more to it than asking for a blessing just for himself. Just for himself and his people to be happy. He wanted others to know his God too. He wanted everybody, other, everybody to worship this God that he worshiped. So verse 1 and verse 2, it's, again, it says, so, he's, so God says, so David said to God, please have mercy on us and show your approval and bless us so that, so that your way may be known on earth and your salvation among the nations. You know, Psalm 67, in reality, is a message of biblical Christianity in a nutshell. It really is. It says, God wants to bless me for a purpose. God wants to fill me with his Holy Spirit for a purpose. His blessings poured out on his people are meant to be turned into salvation for the nations of this world. That's why we are Christians in America because he has a plan for the whole world. And you guys have been a blessing to me just hearing what you guys are involved in right now. And I know that what you're talking about, Jay, when you say that uh, Britt was a blessing, then too good to be true. I called Britt um, several years ago and asked him if he would consider being on the board of Calvary Relief International. And we sat across the table from each other having breakfast when you could do that. And. Uh, we, I began talking, and he got this smirk on his face. He just started going. And I said, well, we're helping this guy named Stephen in, in northern Africa, and we're helping Gitu. You know, we want to do this, we want to do that. And he goes, well, I know Gitu, and I know Stephen. I've been there. I've been to their houses. <laughs> I said, oh, really? I didn't know Miles was playing a tick, trick on me. But. So obviously, we were already aligned in our hearts towards serving people in Africa. Um, and God has teamed us together now. What a blessing that is. So God loves me and he blesses me so that I might make him and his salvation and his way known amongst the nations. You know, in, in Genesis chapter 2, we won't go there now, but very briefly is the call of Abraham to leave his home, to leave his family, and to go into a nation that God would tell him about someday as he was getting closer to that nation. Um, he says that you shall be a blessing. You shall be blessed and you shall be a blessing. The same message as David is giving now. We are blessed and we are to be a blessing. Abraham, as we are today, both are recipients of God's blessings. And we're also a conduit of God's blessings at the same time. You know what happened to the Dead Sea, right? You heard the story of why the Dead Sea is the Dead Sea, why there is no life there at all. And you've been there many more times than I have been, but you have the Sea of Galilee and then you have the Sea of uh, uh, the Dead Sea and they are both fed by the same river. And the only difference between the Sea of Galilee is that it's fed from uh, the River Jordan and it has life and it has fish and people use it and they, um, they, they have 
plants all around it. They wash their clothes. They drink it. They do all this stuff because it's a life-giving, pure water. And then the, it has an outflow that goes right into the Dead Sea. And the difference between these two bodies of water is that the Galilee, the live sea, has an outflow. There's actually has an outflow, has water coming in, has water going out, keeping it fresh, keeping it powerful, keeping it alive. The Dead Sea receives all this water and there is no outflow except for that which evaporates. It leaves all the garbage behind, all the, all the salts and all the minerals behind to where nothing can live in it. I've floated in it. It's so salty that you're kind of buoyant on the top of it. Many of you probably have been there. It's not a beautiful place. But it's a very great example of how our lives as Christians can be if there's not an outflow towards the nations. If our heart is not in conformation with Jesus' heart of reaching the nations. If we are taking our blessings and we're banking them or putting them in our safety deposit box for later use for ourselves, and that's all that we're doing, then we become a dead sea. And if everything that we do evolves around getting that bank account bigger of God's blessings without planning to use them, eventually those will be taken away from us. Throughout the Bible, Israel focused on the blessings that they would receive from God while ignoring their responsibility to be a blessing to others around them. They wanted to keep the Messiah to themselves. They wanted to keep all of this stuff. The temple was for them, and, and they had a real hard time. They would keep everybody else outside of the temple, and only they could go into the temple and really have a relationship with God. And they wanted to keep it all to themselves, even though God was saying that I am a God of all nations. So yes, I can be unashamedly asking for God's blessing day after day after day. And I think we should. Because when we have this kind of an attitude of saying, God, pour your blessings out on me so that my neighbors might know you, so that the nations might know you. What a blessing. You guys are in, involved in a church that is reaching out around the world, but you are unique, I'm sad to say. That there are most, Cal most churches really are inward looking. We just got done for a eight month trip around the United States. We sold our home in Tuolumne County in, in January. We moved into a 30 year old 18 foot trailer and my little diesel truck out there pulling it around. Best time we've ever had in our lives. And as soon as we got out there trying to knock on doors for Calvary Chapels, COVID hit, ooh, and everything closed up. So we had to kind of replan things. But when we walk into many of the churches around this nation, we would see no missions boards or very disregarded missions board that nobody really knew who was on them. They didn't know how much money got sent, if anything, to them. Nobody was going on missions trips. Yeah, they went to Israel a lot of times, but they did not go on missions trips to be able to really take the gospel to the nations. And it's kind of heartbreaking to see because I really believe that the tr Christian church in America is called to be the light of the world. It used to be England, didn't it? Scotland, England, these were the missionary sending nations of the world and God was blessing them beyond measure now they're hardly sending anybody out. And I know that uh, you know, the countries around England now are almost considered, I think they are considered, unpe unreached people groups. Scotland and Ireland and these places have very little Christian witness in them now. All centered around one of the most missionary-minded countries in the world at one time. Just in a couple of generations, they lost everything. America is going in the same direction unless God wakes us up and reminds us that our relationship with him is so important and he wants to pour his life into us and he wants to pour his blessings upon us so that our neighbor might one day stand before the throne room of God and worship him with us so that 
the people in Afghanistan, the people in Africa, the people in Costa Rica will one day stand before that same God that we worship and their hands lifted up or on their faces. I'm not going to read it to you because of time today, but in Revelation chapter 7, I'm just going to give you a quick um, overview of what is there. Revela Revelation chapter 7, 4 through 7 really is, um, John gets a glimpse into heaven and he's standing there and he's, he's in a trance. He's not sure if he's awake or he's asleep, but all of a sudden he looks up and he sees a door standing wide open in heaven and he sees, he hears a voice like a trumpet. That sounds familiar, huh? We're waiting for a voice that is like a trumpet right now. Come up here, he hears. And I will show you the things that have to happen after this. And a little farther down in chapter 7 of, of uh, Revelation, it says this. Behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne, before the Lamb, crying out, with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God and sits on the th and he who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And everyone fell on their faces before the throne of God and worshipped him, saying, Blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. You know, this heavenly scene is the purpose of our blessings. It's the outcome of God's people being blessed by God and using them properly. Think about it. One day we will be in that throne room with this multitude of uncounted people and I'll be standing back there and I'll be looking for people that I know. I'll be saying, look, I told him about Jesus. What a blessing. He's here. That's what it's about. And these people, they don't care who I am. I don't want to say, hi, hey, I'm Lane, remember me? Here on earth, I'm here to point them to Jesus, and they're in that room, room they're, they're in that throne room. I am there to worship Jesus with them. And there will be a countless, innumerable amount of people there. How many people are you inviting to go there? That is why we are blessed. So when you put a check into the, into the basket or when you go to another country or when you guys come and you pray for your missionaries, these things are happening out there. When you go out there and you're sharing with these people who are starving to death the love of Jesus Christ and then giving them food to eat for the day, they look at you like, wow, I want to know the God that he knows because he has come all the way here to tell me this. What a blessing that is for us. And as we are blessed, we turn that blessing into more blessings for more people because you understand that it's not you that's doing it. It's not you that's having to cost anything. It's God pouring through you that no longer are you a bank of these blessings, but that conduit is flowing, the river is flowing through you and it's bringing life to many people all around you not a stagnant puddle somewhere that nobody that is no good use for anybody. Verse 3 through 7 in our text there in, in uh, Psalm 67 continues. I believe that once we become conduits and we understand that we are blessed to be a blessing, our prayer will be like David's. And we'll begin to declare like David. Let the peoples praise you, O oh God. Let all the peoples praise you. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Yes, God, our God shall bless us, and then all the nations of the earth shall fear him. Have you ever heard that before? Have you ever read that before? I want to, I want to challenge you to go home and read just those few verses one more time that our God will bless us, and as a result of God blessing his people, all the nations of the earth will also bow down and worship before him. The Muslims aren't going to accomplish that, but they're out there. The Mormons aren't going to accomplish that, but they are out there in forces, and they are very heavily financed. In some nations, Uganda is one of them, 
You walk down the street and there are mosques on every corner, brand spanking new. There's not, maybe not even any Muslims in the area, but they are pre preparing. They're getting ready. They're sending people in. They're sending money here. They're buying people houses. They're bringing food in to win people to Allah so they can enslave them, basically. We have a God that wants to free people and it's very hard to find other Christian missionaries out there many times. And when you do many times, not to bring shame, not to bring anything to anybody, because I'm guilty of it, a lot of it too, is that most of the missionaries we find out there are underfunded and they're struggling. They're struggling big time. Their churches are struggling, the missionaries are struggling, their families are sick or they have to come home. What kind of, a, of an impact am I making around the world when that is happening out there? Is something, these are verses that have changed my life. These are verses that have made me look into my own heart and say, why do you exist? Why are you called to missions in the first place, man? And that is to bring others into the throne room of God to be a worshiper with me. Universal worship of God and filling of his throne room with more worshipers is what we are called to do. We are blessed so that all nations and some of our neighbors too will one day stand before almighty God and worship him with us. Revelation chapter 7 is proof that the great commission that you guys mentioned this morning of go and make disciples in all nations will one day be fulfilled. That scene that we saw in heaven, that John saw in heaven, of the multitude of people standing before the throne will one day come to pass because of, the, of, God, of Jesus' proclamation, go into all nations and preach the word. Even as Jesus pr promised in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, saying, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all of the world as a witness to all nations. And when all nations have heard, then the end will come. You want to meet Jesus? You want to be in that throne room? Get out there and tell people about Jesus because who knows, that one person that you lead to Jesus might be that last one that Jesus is waiting for. That's on the Lamb's list. Ever thought about that, huh? I love it. Every time I'm praying for somebody, I got my hand on their shoulder and I'm going, <laughs> Is this the one, Lord? Come on, please. <laughs> kind of selfish, I guess, but <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Expectation. So, all these blessings, even in the midst of a pandemic, we're not starving. We might have lost our jobs. Our bank accounts might be a little slower or smaller and they're not growing as fast. Some, of them, some people have lost their houses. I understand that it is a pain and I understand that it is a struggle. But my friends in Kenya, our friends in Kenya and in Burundi, they have nothing to build with. They have nothing to eat. They have no electricity in many parts of their cities. They have no running water because people have ran from their jobs. The governments are shutting down and leaving the people to fend for themselves. Most people live day by day, which means they go out and search for something that they can find or make to bring to somebody else that will give them some shillings, and they take those shillings and they buy a piece of fruit, and they take a piece of fruit to their family, and if that fruit doesn't come to their family that day, their family does not eat that day. They are on week, month number four now, or five, of complete shutdown where they can't even work in the streets. They can't sell, they can't buy, they can't do anything. So a lot of food distribution is going out through many people that I know right now. These verses have changed my life along with a prayer that I read. Um, I was studying um, Samaritan's Purse. I've gone out with them a couple of times, and or one time, sorry and started studying Bob Pierce. Bob Pierce was the founder of um, Samaritan's Purse before Franklin Graham actually took it over. And they went, after he died, they were going, his kids were going through his Bible, and in his Bible several times was written this phrase that impacted me greatly and has changed the way I pray, 
I pray, and it's changed the way I live. Changed my whole outlook on the world. He says, let my heart be broken by the same things that break the heart of God. I don't recommend it unless you're ready. Because it is a life-changing prayer. And it is a heartbreaking prayer. What breaks God's heart? Abortion breaks God's heart. Divorce breaks God's heart. People going to hell breaks God's heart. People starving to death breaks his heart. People being used as slaves, sex slaves, work slaves. These things break their heart, our heart, hit God's heart, and they should break ours as well. When you start praying that prayer and you start aligning it with some of David's prayers for the nations, God will take your heart and he will t take the stone that might be there when you're living for yourself and he'll turn it into a, a heart of flesh. And all of a sudden you'll understand that your, your prayers are being changed, your actions are being changed, your priority or, or priorities are being changed.